This is a new, another semester, another worldview training session. Feels a bit like Groundhog Day. No? That's kind of anticlimactic, right? We have a Groundhog Day after winter's already over, so. Is it? Well, let's pray and we'll start. Father, we love you and we thank you for your word, which illumines our hearts and changes our lives and gives us hope in, that we have in your son. We pray as we discuss important things today that your spirit might apply them to our hearts and our lives. We might be filled with more gratitude for who you are. In Jesus' name, amen. All right, quick review for what we did the last uh, previous semester. So Christian worldview, it, it goes through the story of creation, fall, redemption, and consummation. And the the, the different things we discuss in that big story, the, the big building blocks, and they come from philosophy, are ontology, epistemology, and then this semester we'll start with axiology. So real quick with ontology, here's what we're to quick review, and here's the main takeaways I hope you took over the last year and a half or two years. With ontology, with the main thing you want to know is that creation is good. right? God made this world good. And um, I don't think we get this yet in, in the Christian world. In fact, when I listen to Christian music, like on Christian radio, not our radio station, don't be silly, but Moody Radio, um, like every third song has something that's Platonic, something that's Gnostic, something that's dualistic. Um, in fact, I, I kind of mashed together, I'll just sing it for you real quick, just, to, for, just for review, just some of the, the lines in our old songs and current songs that just don't quite get this. Um, this world is not my home, I'm just a passing through. My treasures are laid up somewhere beyond the blue. I'll fly away, oh glory, I'll fly away. Like a bird from prison bars has flown, I'll fly away. Somewhere in outer space, God has prepared a place for those who love him and obey. When we all get to heaven, this robe of flesh I'll drop and rise and seize the everlasting price. I once was a stranger, outcast on earth, a sinner by choice and an alien by birth. So thank you, O oh my Father, for sending us your Son and leaving your spirit till the work on earth is done? Like, when's that gonna happen? Right, so as I sang that, if, there's, if you didn't know why those songs were bad, you need to go back and review the ontology session, right? That creation is good, and we should not sing that our body is bad, and we're not aliens, right? We're not Martians, we're humans. So the goodness of creation is the main takeaway. The second thing is, this is important for a Christian liberal arts at school like us. If creation is good, and creation is our home, we also have this command from God in the very beginning of the Bible to develop culture to make something of this place. Why, what's the point of a liberal arts education? Creation matters, culture matters. And um, so we want to uh, certainly talk about salvation and Jesus and, and God, but with that, married to that, uh, the goodness of this place and the need to develop culture. Then we come to the fall with ontology, and of course, because of the fall, there's, there's death and natural evil and and Romans 5 says we all died because of what Adam did. And then redemption. It's the resurrection in Jesus, Colossians 1.18. He's the firstborn of the dead. So Jesus' resurrection gives promise that someday we will rise too. Then the consummation will be the new heaven and the new earth. And we'll have spiritual bodies, still physical, but unable to be destroyed. And we'll have a higher, more advanced culture than we even have now. So that's ontology going through the story. But the main things to remember, creation is good. And we have a mandate, a command from God to develop culture. And that grounds our majors in, in our classes. Then we come to, the, to epistemology. And the main two things to take away there is, uh, first, the, the correspondence theory of truth. We believe that truth is not just relative to the individual or to society or to a culture. But something is true if what I say about that thing is what God says about that thing. If our statements correspond to what God knows, then it's true. So the correspondence theory of truth, and then secondly, the authority of Scripture. 
Right? We stand under the Word of God. We submit to it. We make no apologies for the Bible. We, we never say, well, I wish it wasn't in the Bible, but it's there, so we have to do what it says. No, we submit our whole selves, our, our, our minds, our hearts, our emotions, everything to the Word of God. If it's in the Bible, and we're interpreting it correctly, of course, we can assume it's for our good. And by the way, every culture, uh, the, offensive, the offensive bits in the Bible change as culture changes. I never would have guessed 10 years ago that maybe the most offensive verse in the whole Bible is Genesis 127 today. God made us in his image, male and female. Like for most of my life, that was almost boring. Like, okay, whatever. And now it can sound in certain contexts like you're, you're hating on people. So different parts of the Bible will offend different cultures at different times. That's normal. That says more about the culture than it does about the Bible or... Um, or about God. So we submit to the word of God. So with creation, with epistemology, God made us finite. Right? We're not God. We're, God's infinite. We are finite. So our, our knowledge, of course, is limited. But God made us with finely functioning mental faculties. Our eyes were working properly, our ears, our senses, our, our intelligence. But then with the fall, the fall didn't just cause us to die. The fall also damaged our minds. Uh, the big word we use for this is noetic effects of sin from the Greek word nous, which means mind. So because of the fall, we don't think as clearly as we otherwise would. Uh, we make more mistakes. We misuse our minds. Think about Satan. Satan, probably the most intelligent creature God ever made, and he's, he's, doing a, he's pursuing a very foolish program. He has to know this is not going to work, and he keeps trying. Uh, that's noetic effects of sin. And then with redemption, of course, Scripture. John Calvin says Scripture are the glasses you put on, the spectacles that help you see what's going on in nature clearly. And then with the consummation, God himself, Emmanuel, he'll be with us, and we'll see Jesus face to face, and we'll understand God better when we see him. 1 Peter 1.12 says, angels stand on tiptoe trying to understand something about God better, and I think that's probably grace, the, the grace and love of God. So with, with ontology... Big two things, remember, creation is good, and we have a command to develop culture. With epistemology, it's correspondence theory of truth and the authority of scripture. Those are the, the four main takeaways. Now we want to start axiology, which has to do with values and ethics. And I thought, um, this morning, I thought, before we go into the fall, before we go into creation and all this with axiology, I want to emphasize, like, I don't want to bury the lead. When it comes to axiology, I want to start with, like, the most important thing I could ever tell you. The most important thing that, from all of this, like, we're going to say it right now, and it has to do with the fall and redemption aspects of axiology. So it's the gospel. Like, what is the gospel? There's a lot of confusion in our circles, in our churches, in our schools, about what is the gospel. So I want to take some time and do that this morning, kind of go off script, but this, is, this matters most. The gospel, the word means good news, right? Really great news. The angel told the shepherds, I bring you good news of great joy. That will be for, for all the people. There is some confusion today because as, as we try to do good things for God, right, we sometimes make the confusion that, that we are the gospel. Somehow, when we talk about, like, we need to incarnate Jesus. Like, we are the hands and feet of Jesus, is one example. We, uh, we, we are the good news. Well, no, we're not, we're not good, and we're not even news. There's only one Jesus, and we are not him. There's only two hands and two feet that Jesus has, and they're in heaven right now, at the right hand of the Father. So let me just read a 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where Paul says what the gospel is. 1 Corinthians 15, 1. Now, brothers, I want to remind you of the gospel that I preached to you, which you received and on which you have taken your stand. By this gospel you are saved if you hold firmly to the word I preached to you. Otherwise, you have believed in vain. For what I received, notice twice Paul says, I'm telling you the good news that I received. The gospel, the good news, is not something you and I achieve. It's something that we receive. And the good news, well, it, it, it's, it's content, it's a message. This is what I passed on to as a first importance, that Christ died for our sins 
according to the scriptures. He was buried. He was raised on the third day, according to the scriptures, and appeared to Peter and the twelve and, and five hundred at one time. So the gospel is what Jesus has done. So there's, um, I think it's a well-meaning statement. You've, I'm sure you've heard it. Share the gospel at all times, and if necessary, use words. Now I, I know what they're trying to say there, but that that's really an unfortunate statement. If you're going to share the gospel, you have to use your words. You can't act it out. You can't do the gospel. The gospel is the content about what Jesus has done for us. We receive the gospel. Um, the gospel is, it's a hand out, right? The gospel is not a hand up. God, Jesus does the whole thing. It, it's, it's grace. And this is really important because I think the number one heresy in our churches, in the American evangelical world, is the heresy of, the big word is Pelagianism. Pelagius was a 4th century British monk who was trying really hard to encourage believers to live better. And so he gave them a kick in the pants and said, try harder, like you got this. And Augustine, the greatest theologian in the Western church, took him on and said, Pelagius, um, I don't hear enough grace in what you're talking about. The good news is not try harder. First of all, that's exhausting. And secondly, that's how you go to hell. Like if, you, if you want to avoid hell, it, it's, it's you rest in Jesus. That, that's it. You, you put all your weight, you go limp, you rest completely in Jesus. So here's, um, here's a good check in our churches, in our music, right, in our songs. Does this song make much of Jesus? Does this song boast in Jesus? Because I've noticed increasingly a lot of our worship music in church and on, on radio, they don't boast in Jesus. Some of the most popular ones, they praise Jesus for what Jesus thinks about me. That's perverse. That's weird. That's upside down. That's backwards. Um, there's another really popular song right now, and uh, the phrase is this phrase, um, if, if I love better and you love better, our love will live forever. Well, you don't need Jesus for that. Right? That's, that's all the pressure's on me. I have to live better, and if you live better, then, then somehow our love... No, that's, that's heresy. That's not boasting in Jesus. So the most important thing I can tell you is the gospel, the good news. It's not something you and I do for, for God. It's something Jesus has done for us. And um, I mean, a couple other examples. Um, and, and God bless the marketing people because it's tough to be in marketing and trying to attract students. But not that long ago, Cornerstone had the marketing slogan, build a life that matters. Really? Like, your life doesn't matter unless you build it? And somehow we help you build it? That's not the God. That's not, that's not good news. The good news is that Jesus, because of Jesus and resting in him, because Jesus matters, you rest in him, you matter. right? Whether you come to Cornerstone or not, you're resting in Christ, you matter. Uh, seminary, before this, we had a, I have the, the polo shirt with it on the sleeve, building the kingdom one leader at a time. Like, eh, no. You don't find that in the Bible. The Bible never says we build the kingdom. We receive the kingdom. We bear witness to the kingdom. But only Jesus brings the kingdom. So the good news is not what you and I do for Jesus. The good news is what Jesus has done for us. And what we do is receive that, and we rest in that. We put all our weight on Jesus, and we relax. And when we relax, guess what? We get to enjoy creation. Because salvation doesn't rest on me. It's off my shoulders. I'm, I'm secure, I'm safe, I'm significant, I'm somebody in Christ. I, I can breathe, and I can enjoy the life that God has for me. This good news is linked, I think part of the reason why we miss it today is because we have a too low view of the fall, right? Um, the Bible talks a lot about sin. Sin is our problem. But I see, again, in our, in our churches, in our music, in our books, that the, we have euphemisms now for sin. Because sin might be offensive, sin, sin might be misunderstood, so we talk about our brokenness. 
and our failures. And we are broken, and, and we do fail. But Jesus didn't die for brokenness. He didn't die for, for failures, right? Um, failure is when you get a bad grade on a math test. And brokenness is what happens when you play football indoors and you break a window. So brokenness and failures, these are symptoms of a much deeper problem, right? I am a natural-born rebel. Left to myself, I'm, I'm a traitor. I'm, tr I'm treasonous against God. I want my way. And because of that, I'm going to hell. That's why Jesus died. So if you have, a, if you have the biblical view of, of the fall and what my real problem is and what I deserve, and by the way, we, we need to... We, we don't need to preach fire and brimstone sermons, of course not, but, but we do have to at least occasionally, don't we, mention hell? Like, that's got to come up. And I don't think it does much anymore. So people, what, what, people, what, what, tell, what we're telling people in our churches is, here's why Jesus came. So you could be more, feel better about your life, and you could, you could achieve success, and, and you may not be so lonely as you used to be, and maybe not so depressed, and he'll help you, beat anxiety. And, and of course, these, these things matter. But that's not why Jesus died on the cross, right? A, a therapist can help you do those things. Jesus died for sin. And, and no one talked more about hell than Jesus, right? And sometimes we don't like to, to mention hell because we don't want to sell fire insurance. And I get it. I don't either. I don't want to scare people into heaven or to salvation. But Jesus didn't have that hang up. Jesus wasn't above that. Jesus tried to scare the hell out of people. He said things like, cut off your arm, gouge out your eye, don't go there. Right? Jesus spoke more graphically about hell than I'm comfortable with. And that makes me think we should talk more, at least talk about it, so people realize what's at stake. Right? You could not imagine how big the stakes are that we're playing for. It's everlasting torment in hell, or resurrection life with Jesus on this new earth. And so we have to be willing to talk about the bad news so the good news becomes really good news. But I think because we have a, a too small view, a too shallow view of what our problem is, we think that somehow salvation, like we, we contribute. Like we have to work harder. So bottom line is the good news is not try harder. Don't ever ever think, and when you come home from church, okay, if I just try harder, then I'll, I'll no, that's, that's how you go to hell. The good news is you rest in Christ, and out of that rest, you strive. Philippians 2, 12 and 13, work out your salvation with fear and trembling. Why? Because God is at work within you. So yes, we, we do strive, we do work, but it's always a dependent striving. It's always a striving from rest, sort of like, um, like when your, your kids are little and you're teaching them how to swim and your kids are in the deep end of the pool because you're holding them up. And they're saying, look, Mommy, look, Daddy, I'm doing it. I'm swimming. And they are kind of. But just because you're there, and the, ever, and the Father's everlasting arms have us, and as we rest in Him, that's why we're able to, to serve Him. So I'll, I'll stop. That's, that's my rant. But it's the most important rant I could ever rant about. Any questions about just the, the good news, the gospel? It's about what Jesus has done, not us and what we do. Yes. Yeah, I'm, I'm squarely in the Augustinian camp. Yeah, all, all Christians should be in the Augustinian camp. Yeah, Pelagius is a heretic. Now, you, like, I, I disagree with Augustine about some things. But Augustine v. Pelagius, Pelagius is a heretic. The church has spoken. So great, yeah, we, we yeah, I mean, we're Protestant, so I, I disagree with Augustine about um, the place, how works fit in. But uh, what Augustine said about Pelagius, that's, yeah, that's uh, ecumenical Christian orthodoxy. Martin?
Okay. Well, like, Yeah, they, Mar I think it's been, so I mentioned like past marketing slogans and again, it, marketing, it's, I realize the pressure on them, but I think this has always been a problem here and it is a, in a lot of our churches. I mean, this is, Pelagianism is the American temptation. So, yeah, I think, yeah, that, I, that's, yeah, that's, that's not my, it's, I'm just oh, giving you what, yeah. Oh, right, you're, okay. You're talking to us, right. But we don't have the power to change the way things are working. Yeah, okay. I mean, that's a frustration. Right, no, I, 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 I don't yeah, I hear you. Yeah. Thanks, Martin, good point. Yes. Yeah, so that's a common, I, it's a chapter, I may have had a book, Urban Legends of Theology, and that's one of the short chapters, and, and I don't want to be, that, that's, um, that's, I wasn't planning to even say that, it just came stream of consciousness, but it, it's, a, it's the least offensive of all the other stuff, but it is, it's actually not true, so I would be gentle, right, because a lot of Christians say it's a, almost, uh, I can give you the chapter to say how I treat it in the book, but try to be gentle, but, um, it's worse when we say, I mean, it's worse when people say we're actually going to incarnate God. Like, my job is to somehow incarnate God. Like, whoa, now you're in serious trouble. Because there's only one incarnation of God, and that's Jesus. So if, if a student said that, I would say, well, if it was me, I would go to 1 Corinthians 12 and say the, the hands and feet, it's a metaphor that Paul's using about the body of Christ. And the point is that we, we need each other. It's about we needing each other in the body. It's not about what we're presenting to the outside world. So actually your job as a Christian, as a Christ follower, is easier than you think. Your job is not to be Jesus. Your job is to point to Jesus and bear witness to Jesus. He's already done So actually, in a gentle way, say, you're making the Christian life harder than it has to be. You're putting more pressure on yourself than, than you need. And you can distract from Jesus and make it about us. Which, um, we, we want to do good things for Jesus, right? That's important. That's part of sanctification. That's part of, of what the church does. But because we're Americans, and Americans are gitter done people, right? we're the most practical people that God ever made. Like, we can, we can put on a party. Give us, give us an hour, and we can put on a party, like no one's business, with sign-up sheets and all of it. We, we tend to be shallow people, but we're practical. And so we want, when we go to church, we, uh, preacher, give me three things I can do. Give me something practical that I can do today to change my life. And again, it, there's a place for this, right? But just know that this is our, our temptation is to, um, to focus on ourselves and what we are doing. And so even as we try to apply the gospel to our lives it has to come from a place of rest rest in jesus that's what i mean that's every week i say that to our church because i when i die i want that on my tombstone rest in jesus i guess because i won't be resting at that point but um like i want that to be like that's the thing if we just do that then everything else can flow out of that Okay, let's go on then for today's discussion. Uh, axiology, it covers three distinct areas. Ethics, which deals with obligation or right from wrong. We'll talk about that today. 
values, which deals with goodness and beauty or good from bad, and then motivation, why we do, why we choose what we do. And we'll talk about all three of these, ethics, values, motivation. The gospel that I just talked about actually addresses all of these. Ethics, like what we do, and value, valuing Jesus and what he did more than what we do for him. And then motivation, this, um, because of Jesus and what he's done, this changes why we live for him, right? This, this is why this is gospel, because this is why Augustine was right against Pelagius. We, we do want to serve Jesus, but we serve Jesus because we are accepted. We don't serve Jesus to gain his acceptance. Right? This is why this is, the order matters so much. Um, because God has accepted me, that's why out of gratitude I want to please him and serve him. But if we get the order backwards, and somehow my right standing with God, my acceptance depends on me and how well I am living, well, that's how you go to hell. Right? That's, that's the Pharisee. So these are the three areas we'll talk about. And I want to make the point that our category, axiology, it is related to the other categories, ontology and epistemology. Ontology would be what is. And axiology deals with what ought to be. So ought follows from is. So example, if somebody thinks that, if someone's a materialist, and ontologically speaking, they think matter is all that exists. There is no soul, there is no immaterial world, just physical things are all that is real. Well, their epistemology would likely be, well, have to be, an empiricist, right? If, if matter is all that exists, well, how do you know anything? Well, through your senses. You see it, touch it, hear it, taste it. And then their axiology would likely be hedonism, right? Live for physical pleasure. That, that's all there is. So just all we are, are higher functioning animals anyway. So just get as much pleasure as you can. Eat, drink, and, mer and be merry for the tomorrow we die. If someone was an immaterialist, let's say they think that immaterial things are what's ultimately real, the, the non-physical, this person would tend to be a, a rationalist in their epistemology. Because you, you know through reason and thinking, or perhaps a mis mysticism, right? Uh, like Buddhism. Um, Buddhism says, like, nothing here is, everything is an illusion. What's real is an immaterial things. And so, how do you access that? And how do you get this nirvana? You, you do it through mystical, uh, through, through mysticism and trying to make your mind break down and have irrational thoughts. Well, if you think that immaterial things are all that is, what would your axiology likely be? You could be ascetic, like a monk, because the physical um, isn't real, so you try and put down your physical body and live for the immaterial things. So monasticism, asceticism would work, but you might as well just as well be a hedonist, right? Because if your body isn't real, if all that exists is immaterial things, well, then you, you could indulge, because it doesn't affect you. It's just your body. It doesn't affect your soul. And interestingly, I think, in 1 Corinthians, the church in Corinth would trend this way. Right? The church in Corinth was a hyper-spiritual church. They were focused on the immaterial things. And so it's striking that in 1 Corinthians 6 and 7, Paul is addressing both extremes. In 1 Corinthians 6, these spiritual-minded Corinthians were saying, everything's permissible to us. We can do whatever we want. And so Paul, from verses 12 through, the end of, uh, through verse 20, says, no, you, you can't do whatever you want. Your body matters, and your body's not for fornication, and you were bought with a price. Um, don't have sex outside of marriage. And then chapter 7 begins, and he says, um, he goes the other direction. He said, you, there are some of you who are saying, don't have sex and, and don't get married. And so the Corinthian church, because they were so heavily minded, when it comes to their ethics, they go and both directions. Either be a hedonist, do whatever you please, or try and rise above the physical world, because the immaterial is all that matters. But I just wanted to show you that there is a connection in these categories. I want to talk now about ethics. And there are three ethical categories. And here are the big ones. There's things that are impermissible, which you are not allowed to do. Things that are, they'd be immoral. You must not do these things. Then there are things that are permissible. 
things that you may do. And so by the way, ethics is the category also used, you can use the word morality, and this, this category describes actions, right? It does not describe things. You don't have a righteous table or a moral chair, right? So if something is an action, it, it can be just falls into one of these three categories. And when we say morality, again, I talked about the gospel, and, and that's, like a, that's still a form of ethics. But here we're talking about morality as not, not the Christian life, not how Christians are to live, but the Christian view on how everyone should live. So think, Lewis Smees wrote a book once called Mere Morality. So there is an ethics for Christians, right? And church, going to church and praying, reading your Bible, spiritual disciplines, that matters. But here we're talking about the biblical Christian view on how everyone should be, how everyone should live. So mere morality. Um, so in this description of actions then, some things are clearly not permissible, things that no one should ever do. Some things are allowed, permissible, you, you may do these things. And then within that category, there are some things which you not only may do, but they're obligatory. You must do these things. Now, some of you may, and that's, that's fine, I put obligatory as a subcategory within permissible. And you might think, well, maybe it, maybe it should be its own third category. So there's two main, as I have it, there's two main categories with a subcategory. Or you could say, let's just cut the pie in three, three sections and say one section is impermissible, one's permissible, one's obligatory. So I don't care if you like it that way, that that's fine. But this makes sense to me as well. The main thing is there's, there's three categories that describe actions. What I'd like you to do now, take three, four minutes at your tables, discuss which, which category do you think is the largest category? Which category? describes more actions. Are there more things in the world, more actions in the world that are impermissible? Are there more actions that are permissible? Or are there more actions that are obligatory? Does that make sense? Which is the largest category? So take three or four minutes, discuss, and see what, what you think. Okay, do you guys have a, which table would you like to share? Which category describes, by the way, you can define these in terms of each other. So if something is impermissible, then it's obligatory, you must not do these things. So they are, here obligatory is talking about more positive things you must do, but things that are not permissible, they're things that you must not do. Um, any, which one is the bigger category? Things you must not do, things you may do, or things you must do? Any thoughts? Uh, okay. So everything is permissible, but not everything. Now he didn't mean everything is permissible. Some things, there are the Ten Commandments. So Paul says, he's quoting a Corinthian slogan, right? The Corinthians are saying, everything's permissible, First Corinthians 6. We can do whatever we want. He's saying, okay, sure, but not everything is helpful. So actually, I mean, Paul's a good Jew, and he has the Old Testament. He knows there's some things like idolatry, for instance, is not permissible. But we would not? Oh, so permissible is the big category. Everybody agree with that? What, that's, that's important, isn't it? That's just important to know. That helps. It would have helped Eve, right? God made this beautiful garden and said, you may eat from all the trees. All the trees are permissible to you. He didn't say you must eat from all of them because you would have got fat. But, but you, you're, allowed to eat from all, you're allowed to eat from any of them, right? And there's just one. There's just one 
impermissible tree. If she had remembered, I can eat any of the trees except one, that would have helped. Because the serpent comes along and he spins it and said, did God really say you can't eat from any of them? Like the, the impermissible category? Isn't that the biggest category? And by the way, the serpent was crafty, right? So that's why he asked it as a question. You know, not, not all questions are actually questions. Some questions are assertions, right? And someone says to you, are you insane? They're, they're saying something, right? So you, you can say things, as, just because you put a question mark at the end of the statement doesn't mean it's not an assertion. And Eve's response, I think, was, was actually pretty good. Uh, she corrected the serpent. And she said, God said, don't, don't even touch it, which is what God meant. Right? When God said, don't eat of it, he meant stay away. Right? The first people that would have heard the story would have been Jews. And Jews know what this tree represented. It's an unclean thing. And what's God's will about unclean things? You stay away. You don't touch. You don't, you don't play with pigs. Right? Um, God would not have been amused if he came down and saw Adam and Eve playing catch with the fruit. Right, passing it past their mouth for pretend bites. They, no, we didn't actually eat it. No, you don't play with it. You don't touch it. So what Eve said was, was actually a good response. But the problem is she's responding. There are some questions you don't give the time of day. Right? You don't talk to snakes. By, by, by responding to the serpent, she gave credence to the question. She, she made it sound like it's an actual honest question. And now the snake has her talking. And then he comes back with a direct contradiction to what God had said. So it helps, it helps me avoid sin, and I think it would help all of us avoid sin, if we remember that there's just a few things that God says we must not do. Right? God is our creator. He wants us to have fun. Like every, every parent, any good parent, wants their kids to enjoy themselves. Every rule that a parent has is to keep their kids safe and keep them alive for another day so they can enjoy themselves again. But, of course, kids don't understand that. They don't know why we can't have more cotton candy. And so they think somehow the parents are against them. Or we don't know why we can't cross this crack in the driveway. They don't understand cars and danger. We just have to have, we just need them to trust us. I can't explain it to you, but you just have to believe I'm on your side. I think, wow, that's kind of like God and me. Like, I don't understand all of the commands, why, but if I just trust that he's for me, that goes a long way. The Ten Commandments, why are they negative? Thou shalt not, thou shalt not. Not because God is a downer and trying to hold us down. They're negative because that's the way to give us the most freedom. Right? There's a few things, there's ten things you must not do. The rest of the world, it's yours. Knock yourself out. So next time we'll talk more about how we determine what goes in these categories. But this is probably a good stopping place just to remember the biggest category is things that are permissible. And that's not a bad thing to pass on to our students. Like You have way more freedom than sometimes you think God gives you. And don't listen to the serpent. Right? There's a few things, and for good reason, a, a few things to avoid. Otherwise, the world is yours. Have fun.